welcome to the first webinar in our series about the basics of photography. I'm Angela Nicholson, and it's usually about this stage where I would introduce the speaker. But um, actually, thinking about it, I used to teach photography at adult education centres. I used to be the technical editor of AP, Amateur Photographer Magazine, and I used to be the head of testing at Future Publishing. So I thought that perhaps I should uh, do this series myself. So this is the first part. It's about exposure and what is exposure. So I'm just going to start by sharing my screen. OK, so before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor. And we have a word from our sponsor, which is Fujifilm. Fujifilm is one of the most well-known photography brands in the world. We pride ourselves in listening to people who use our equipment and have created a range of award winning cameras and lenses based on that feedback. There is something for all types of photographer and videographer in the X-Series and GFX system. So thank you very much to Fujifilm for sponsoring this series of webinars. Now, as Fujifilm is very keen to point out, although this um, webinar is sponsored by them, it is open to anybody, whatever camera you use, um, or maybe you haven't got a camera yet, you're just thinking about getting started in photography and you, know, you want to get um, some basics under your belt before you buy a camera. So welcome and it's great to see so many people here so as i said i'm going to be covering the basics of photography um, and specifically with, there's going to be five webinars but this is the first one and we're looking at exposure and what is exposure so there's a few things that we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about photography and exposure the first thing is that there are lots of things that are connected and it's really hard to explain them individually and to understand them individually because they're all linked and um, you know you just have to jump in somewhere and start with an explanation and also you have to have a leap of faith that things will start to connect and you will eventually understand so uh, i'm starting with an explanation of what is exposure and we'll be looking at other aspects at a later date in future webinars so the first thing to know is that the numbers are very strange. Um, you know, you may have been looking at your camera and you see f22 or maybe just 22 and f5.6 and a 60th and 125th and all these strange numbers. There is a reason for that, but it is really confusing and it doesn't necessarily help with learning about photography. But don't worry, it will eventually make sense. The other thing is it's not you. It is photography. It is quite tricky to understand at first. There's a bit, you know, a few head scratching moments. And when somebody first explained photography to me and exposure, I just didn't get it either. And it just takes a while. So bear with me. Um, this isn't going to be the longest webinar we've ever done. It's it might be one of the shorter ones because I don't want to bombard you with information. I want to make it uh, digestible and we will go over um, things in future webinars. So don't miss the next webinars. So what is exposure? Well, a lot of people describe it as the brightness of the image. And in some ways, that's that's really understandable because you look at a picture and you think whether it's dark or bright, uh, is it over or underexposed? But really, it's exposure is the amount of light that is required to make an image. Now that is controlled by the amount of light which reaches the sensor. And the thing that controls the amount of light that reaches the sensor is the amount of time that the shutter is open, which is also known as the exposure time uh, or the shutter speed and the aperture. And the aperture is the size of the hole in the lens through which the lens, sorry, which through, through which the light passes. And that aperture is a variable size. You, you adjust it um, using your aperture settings. The sensitivity of the film or sensor um, is also important and sensitivity with digital cameras is what we control with what we call ISO. So when the when the sensor is made more sensitive, it doesn't require as much light to create an image as it does when um, it's got it's set to a low value like 100. And we will cover this in more detail in later webinars. So how do we assess exposure? I mean, you and I, we go out for walking, um, you know, you look at a scene and you think, oh, right, it's a landscape, it's a blue sky, green fields, uh, sun is shining, some trees over there, and we kind of recognise everything. And our eyes are really, and our brains are really good at adjusting um, to different exposure levels, and we can make out what we're looking at. And then we walk inside, and immediately we're in a darker environment, but our eyes adjust and our brains adjust, and we can see everything. <laughs> 
cameras aren't quite like that. They need, uh, they're, they're basically computers and they're quite sophisticated computers these days, but they need um, some information. You know, they need to, to, to be told what they're looking at and they, they are getting increasingly sophisticated. So um, DSLRs, they have a dedicated exposure sensor inside them that actually is dedicated to looking and measuring the exposure. Mirrorless cameras and DSLRs in live view mode, that's when you are composing the image on the screen on the back of the camera rather than in the viewfinder, they use the imaging sensor. Now this is the key difference between, one of the key differences between mirrorless cameras and SLRs is that the viewfinder on a mirrorless camera shows the image on the sensor rather than um, sort of a clear view through the lens. So if you look at a mirrorless camera's um, viewfinder, you will see the image from the sensor. Cam cameras analyze the brightness of the scene or an area of the scene, depending on the exposure meter setting or photometry setting. Now, a lot of people don't realize that their cameras, you know, we, we're familiar with the idea of, uh, you know, in the past people come along with a light meter and they hold it up and they click it and they look at it and they go and set their camera. Cameras have an exposure meter built in and there are various different settings for that and that is what helps you understand the exposure that you need to set. So a camera's exposure meter will set, uh, sorry, suggest an exposure value and that is a combination of aperture and shutter speed settings and it's up to you to work out which you want to use. So what are the exposure meter or photometry settings? Well, the first one is the most important one, really, because it's the one I recommend that you use the vast majority of the time. And that is called a number of things. Often it's called multi, it could be called evaluative, and sometimes it's called matrix. And this is a really good general purpose setting that divides the scene into zones and then attempts to give a balanced exposure. So typically a camera might divide the, the scene in something like 256 um, areas or, or more or less, you know, it all divides up and it enables the camera to kind of look and see, right, so that area is bright and that area is dark. That might be a landscape and it will try and find a balanced exposure. And this is where some of the traditional teaching of photography can get a little bit unstuck because, as I say, cameras are becoming increasingly sophisticated and things like artificial intelligence are enabling cameras more and more to recognise what they're photographing. You know, we see about um, face recognition and eye auto detection and stuff like that. Um, they help the camera understand what it's looking at and what the exposure should be. Spot metering is another um, very useful uh, metering mode, but it's one I suggest you use with great care. It's incredibly powerful, but with great power comes the ability to cause great damage. Um, and it basically, you know, I mentioned before how evaluative or multi divides the scene up into say 200 or whatever points. This actually just looks at a really small part of the, the frame. So it might be say 4% to 1%, just a tiny area, and it will look at that part of the scene and determine the exposure on the basis of whatever is under that point in the viewfinder or on the back of the camera, you know, where you're looking. So it's a great choice when you've got a really tricky um, situation, really tricky conditions. So if you imagine, for example, you're photographing someone with the sun behind them, they're backlit, and it's really important that you get the exposure of their face just right. So if you put the spot meter over their face, you're telling the camera that is the really important part of this scene, and that is what I want to get the exposure nailed. However, if you accidentally leave it on and this is you know I've, I've done it myself a few times you leave it on and suddenly you're getting wild settings it's because that little point one minute it could be over um, highlight the next bit it could be over a shadow and that will have a really dramatic impact on your settings so sorry on your uh, images so if you're find that finding that you know you're getting one minute you're getting an image that's really bright and the next minute you're getting one that's really dark and the only thing that you've changed is a slight change in the composition it could be that you've accidentally set spot metering or you've forgotten that you've set it to spot metering. So whilst it's really useful, I suggest using it with caution. 
centre weighted metering is another one it's kind of like a halfway house between spot metering and multi-metering it basically looks a central part of the scene because that's where it's assuming the subject is but it also looks at the rest of the scene and the area around it and it tries to give an exposure that takes the area outside into account but puts the focus on the center part so um, for example i've used this before when shooting sport i found it quite useful because it will put the emphasis on the subject say the football player running towards you or whatever um, and if there's a bright advertising hoarding or a really dark one it won't get overly affected by that but you get a nice you, you can get a nice balanced exposure and then this is a fuji specific one actually um, you don't see it that much on other cameras um, average and it's, it's kind of, it's a little bit like an old school uh, metering system, really. And it looks at the whole frame and it gives equal weighting across the frame. And it can work really, really well. It's specifically useful when the scene is quite evenly lit. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's worth experimenting with. And the important thing to note if you're a mirrorless camera user is actually these settings are really less important these days with your type of camera because um, you're looking at the image you'll see, uh, sorry, the image you'll capture you'll, you, you, with all of the settings taken into account. That's what you'll see in the viewfinder and on the back of the camera. So actually, whichever mode you've got selected, if you're about to capture a really dark image or a really bright image, you'll see it. Whereas with an SLR, it's far less obvious because um, they've got, say, a, a direct view. So whereas with um, SLRs and certainly with film cameras, we tended to use these modes more frequently, I would recommend that the vast majority of time you stick to multi evaluative or matrix because they will pretty much get you what you want. And actually, even if you're an SLR user, that they are pretty dependable these days. Um, and another benefit of, of course, with digital photography, unlike film photography, where it was really expensive if, a way of, of testing if you've got the right exposure, you can always take a few shots and just check. So let's look now at the exposure scale. If you look in the viewfinder of your camera or on the uh, on the screen, you'll see that there's a scale that is um, it's how the camera tells you what the exposure settings should be, what it's recommending, whether it thinks you're going to over or underexpose on the basis of the settings which are currently selected. This is marked off in what we usually call one third stop steps or one third exposure values. Now, if you look, I'll, and I'll show you it in a second. Um, if you look at the scale, there are some larger markings and they are whole stops. And then in between you'll see smaller markings and they are one third stops. And it can be a bit confusing uh, when you first get started because people think that they've adjusted by one stop, but actually they've adjusted by one third stop. Now that is important from the point of view of what is a stop. If you adjust, um, an image, sorry, if you adjust the exposure by a whole stop or a whole EV, you are either doubling or halving the amount of light that is hitting the sensor. So obviously it's quite a big difference between one third and a third and it makes quite, you know, it's, it's a very um, dramatic change. So it's, it's quite important to know that. The middle value on the scale is what the camera calculates to be the ideal exposure. Now I've put ideal in uh, quotation marks because you know it's it's the camera's idea of what's ideal it's not yours. The markers either side of this center point indicate sorry if if the marker is either side of the center point then it's indicating that the camera thinks you're either going to over or underexpose the image. Uh, of course yes mirrorless cameras um, and SLRs in live view will also show a lighter, so a lighter or darker image as you adjust. So if, if the graduation mark is above the center point and it's brighter, you will also see a brighter image because you're, you're getting a preview that is reflecting the actual conditions uh, and the actual settings of the camera. So this is the um, scale that we're talking about. Now, if we start just looking at a couple of points here, um, let's start with the, the row at the bottom of the screen. The M, that indicates that the camera is in manual exposure mode. Then the SS, that's shutter speed. And of course, um, that's you're saying 125, it means 125th. So it's 125th of a second. And then we've got the aperture setting 
is F8. And then the sensitivity is ISO 1600. So that's quite high. It's not dramatically high these days, but it's reasonably high. Now, if we look at the column on the left, you can see that the camera is set to what it considers are the optimal conditions or the, sorry, the, you know, the optimal exposure for that scene. So just to zoom in a little bit further, so you can see the scale nice and clearly, and you can see that on the, the right of the column, there is that little marker point, and you can see two dots between each major, each number, each major points, and those are the one third points. Now you can see I've, I've increased the exposure. So it's now going to, the camera is now indicating that that scene is going to be overexposed in its opinion by one stop or one EV. And conversely here, it's going to be underexposed by one stop. So let's look at a few exposure problems. The first thing you need to know is that a traditional exposure system expects the brightness of a scene to be grey or to mix down to grey. Now, when we're talking about exposure, you don't really need to worry about colour. You just need to talk uh, or think about brightness. So if you've got highlights, they will be balanced out by the shadows in a typical scene. And then anything in between will all scrunch down and mix up and you get a grey. And it's often the camera expects it to be 18 percent grey. Um, and it's really important to remember that. But as I said, cameras are getting increasingly sophisticated. So some will, you know, you sort of think a bit more beyond the basics of what I'm, I'm suggesting here. OK, so this can mean that a very bright scene will trick the camera into underexposing. Now, if you think about um, photographing a snow scene, for example, it's white. The camera, as we said before, expects a scene to mush down to be grey. So it's going to look at that scene and think, right, OK, I'm going to make this grey. So it will basically suggest exposure settings, aperture and shutter speed settings that will underexpose that image and make the, sea, sorry, the snow look grey. And converse to that, a very dark scene may be overexposed so it looks too bright. So if you can imagine you've gone into a coal cellar and you're going to photograph a black cat in there, the camera is going to look at this and think, right, this is going to be grey. This is supposed to be grey. Everything is grey. So it will increase the exposure to make it brighter, to make the image brighter than you would expect it to be. Instead of making the coal black, it will look grey. Now, you can adjust images in software like Photoshop, um, Affinity and uh, Lightroom, all the various um, software packages, and you can brighten them and darken them. But as a rule, it's best to get the exposure right in camera. There's a couple of reasons for that. For example, um, you know, if you burn out the highlights, you can't pull those back. They've gone beyond a level where there's any detail. So what do I mean by burned out highlights? Well, if, if you're looking at um, if you're looking at a landscape with some beautiful white fluffy clouds, if you take an image and actually those clouds are completely uniform and there's no texture in there, you've burned them out and you can't pull that back. If there's a little bit of texture in there, you can probably draw some more out. Similarly, if there are um, deep shadows um, under the trees, for example, in this, this landscape, if you try and brighten that, um, if there's no information at all, if you've made the image too dark, then you'll get a very noisy image. You know, there'll probably be, there won't be much um, colour information and it'll just look really noisy. So as a rule, um, it's best to try and get the image looking right in camera. And there are some times when you, there are good reasons for not doing that. But um, certainly when you're starting out, try and get the settings right, so you get the image that you want in camera. Now, this image, just to illustrate the point about um, how cameras see subjects, this is actually a photograph of a piece of white paper. It's a background sheet of paper. And I've set the camera to spot metering mode and I've set it to program. And I'll explain what that is later. But basically, the camera has set its own exposure settings and it's made that white paper look grey. This is a black piece of paper and all I've done is literally pulled the background, the black paper down, background down, so that it covers the white paper and I've left the camera to its own devices, press the shutter release and I've got another grey image. So if we just go backwards and forwards, there's very little difference in those two. 
the, the, the actual exposure values are different. The camera set different shutter speeds for each image by some distance, actually. But the end result is the two things look the same. That is basically, I've pulled the black down halfway so you to give a half and half image so you can see how different those two uh, things should look. So just hopping back now to talk about the uh, photometry or metering mode settings. As I recommended, the, um, the one I would say to go for is multi. And you can see here, what's happened is we've got a scene which has got some shadow in the foreground because there's some trees behind me and there was, the sun was kind of behind, a little bit hazy because of the clouds. Um, and then we've got a brighter foreground, but a, sorry, brighter midground, and then a much brighter sky. But the camera has looked at it and being able to say, okay, you know, and it's probably, you know, calculated what it's looking at, and it's come out with a pretty balanced exposure. And because I haven't got any really dark shadows or any burned out highlights, I could tweak this image if I wanted, and I've got quite a lot to play with, but it looks, it looks pretty good in camera. This one was with the, the average setting, and I think I was a little bit um, hampered by the fact that the, the sun was going uh, appearing and disappearing behind the clouds. But uh, the average setting has done a pretty decent job, but I think it's because there's quite a lot of sky in this shot, I think it's been slightly skewed by the bright sky and it's just darkened things down a little bit. I quite like it. Um, I think it's worked quite well. So, you know, that's why I say it is worth trying different, um, different settings, but it is worth noting that it is darker than the previous shot. Now, centre weighted. So this was taken with centre weighted and what I did here was the centre, I, I think I positioned the centre point kind of roughly where there's that band in the middle of the scene, um, there's a rise in the hill and there's a bit of shadow. So it was kind of like 50-50. I was trying to basically get the mid middle area over a mid-tone and you can see it's done a pretty good job again. So it's worked quite well in this instance. Now spot and again I was trying to find a mid-tone and it was it's you know sometimes a bit hard but again you know this this is an okay result um i haven't burnt out any highlights i haven't got really really deep shadows so it's okay but now look what's happened for this one i've actually turned the camera up and i've taken a meter reading and set this exposure settings based on the sky and so what's happened is the sky has been made a mid-tone and the foreground has been made really really dark now I could try and brighten this up, of course, in software, but I think, you know, some of the darker areas, it would look a bit mushy and a bit noisy, so it's not ideal. So um, that's what can happen if you use spot and you've got the spot over a light or bright point. And this is what happened when I took a meter reading from the dark area, the shadow in the foreground. And as you can see, everything's much brighter, the image is overexposed and the areas of the sky, which are just burnt out. And so if I tried to pull those back in, in Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever, it, they would just be a uniform gray. There wouldn't be any detail there. So it wouldn't look very natural. So now I'm gonna talk about exposure compensation, which is a really useful tool in the semi-automatic mode because it allows you to um, take some contr more control over, the, uh, over how your images are going to look. So exposure compensation tells the camera to give the image more or less exposure, making it lighter or darker respectively. Adding positive exposure compensation increases the exposure to make the image brighter. So if you imagine that, you know, that's going up the scale, you're making a brighter image and a negative exposure, so you're reducing the exposure, makes the image darker. Now, there are a couple of different ways of adjusting exposure compensation. Some cameras have a dedicated dial and you might even see one with um, markings on it, which indicate the exposure value that you're using, you know, exposure compensation value that you're dialing in. Sometimes you have to, there might be an unmarked dial and you just rotate it. And other times there might be a button that you need to press and then you rotate that dial. And if you've got a button that's got a plus and a minus on it, so and usually in black and white, um, then that will be your exposure compensation button. You press that and then you rotate a dial to dial in some positive or negative exposure compensation. So let's now look at some example photographs. Now, this is a, a slightly unusual scene in that it's quite strongly backlit. The sun is actually through the clouds. Um, but in the in the image here and I think actually you know what the camera's done a really good job um, I've set it to multimetering 
and it's done a pretty good job of getting a, a balanced um, exposure because um, the scene looks pretty much as I remember it. The sun was really bright, um, you know, too bright to see it properly. And so I was squinting a little bit and I couldn't see all of the details of the tree. But if you look, there is some detail in the bark. So I think it's done a, a pretty good job. Now, increasing the exposure by one stop, as you remember, I said that's doubling the amount of light that is reaching the sensor. And I've done this through using the exposure uh, compensation controls. Can you see how much more detail we can now see in that foreground tree? Increase again, double the exposure again. Now we're starting to lose a lot of the background because that is the brighter area of this image. So although we can still see more on the tree, the foreground tree, the background is really starting to burn out. Increasing again, we've lost the, most of the background really, certainly any of the sky. To four, um, doubling the exposure again, extremely bright. And by five, we've pretty much burned out most of the image. We've only got the very darkest points being visible. So we're back to the correct exposure. Now let's just take it one stop darker. So we've halved the amount of light entering, or, or sorry, exiting the lens, hitting the sensor. Now, this is really interesting because there's still a little bit, and it probably doesn't convey very well across Zoom, but there's still a little bit of detail visible in the tree trunk in the foreground. It's not just solid black. Um, there's a little bit of detail there. But what's really interesting is the way that by making this image darker, we've brought out the um, rim lighting of the tree. So the moss that's growing on this tree is kind of more obvious, it's, it's, it's more illuminated or it stands out more. And the fern just on the left side there, that's standing out a bit more too. So one stop dark and we've still got that rim lighting, but we're, we've lost most of the detail on the foreground tree now. Taking it down again, I think anything that actually isn't in direct sunlight is black and down to minus four and minus five now, you know, it's, it's pretty much either black or white, this image now. And the reason why I think it's quite interesting, though, is that although everything is um, everything that's a shadow is black or not a highlight is black. If you look the set where the sun is, it's still burned out. And I just wanted to make that point that actually, you know, sometimes you can't capture all of the highlights or all of the shadows and certainly not always in the same image. So thinking now about the exposure modes, auto. Now that is when the camera has complete control. You can't usually even use exposure compensation in this mode. And it's a really useful feature when you first get your camera to have an auto mode, because if you imagine, you know, suddenly you've got so many things to think about. You've got this new camera, you've got to look through the viewfinder on the back of the screen. You've got to think about composition. You've got to think about, um, you know, what you want to shoot. Um, maybe you're controlling the subjects, telling them to look one way or the other, and you've got to think about focusing and, and colour and all of this sort of stuff. So it's really nice to know that actually the auto setting is kind of nail the exposure quite a lot of the time and you'll get a decent image. So, I, you know, I think it's, it's great to use that when you first get a camera. Program mode is like a step on from uh, auto mode. It um, takes control. Uh, to an extent, but it lets you adjust the settings. So it will suggest aperture and shutter speed settings, but you can move it one way or the other, depending on, you might think, oh, actually, you know what? I want a faster shutter speed, so I'll adjust it this way. Or I want a slower shutter speed, or I want a smaller or larger aperture. And what the camera will do, when you make that adjustment, it will adjust the other aspect as well. So it will always produce the same exposure. It just, the way that you do it um, changes. You can also use exposure compensation. So if you're looking at the image, think, well, I want to make the shutter speed a bit uh, faster, I'll do that. And, oh, I actually want to make the image a bit darker. Then you can use the exposure compensation, adjust it. So it's a really good general purpose setting when you're starting out. And if you can, I would switch from using auto to program. Aperture priority is a really useful setting that I use uh, quite a lot. Um, you set the aperture and the camera sets the shutter speed. So it's, it's a nice one because aperture is used to control the, sh the zone of sharpness, what we call the depth of field. And sometimes you might want to control that, but you don't really want to spend ages making sure that the exposure is balanced. So the camera, 
Well, then you don't want to make sure it's balanced. Sorry, you want to, you don't want to have to take control over that. Um, so it's a really useful one like for things like uh, portraits, macro, still life and landscape photography where depth of field or the zone of sharpness is really important. So you can use the aperture to control how much of the background is sharp or blurred and the camera will take control of the shutter speed. You can also use exposure compensation in this setting so you can darken or brighten the image as you like. Now the alternative or the opposite really of aperture priority is shutter priority and in this mode you set the shutter speed and the camera sets the aperture so again you can adjust the shutter speed to say if you want um, to blur movement or you want movement to be sharp you can set a shutter speed accordingly and the camera will adjust the aperture to make sure that the image is correctly exposed and again you can use exposure compensation to make sure that you get the result that you're looking for. Manual, um, you take control over both the shutter speed and the aperture. Now, many people regard, regard using manual as like the holy grail of photography and camera control. And it is really, really useful. And I do use it um, quite a bit. But generally, actually, my default setting is aperture priority. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons why people have their own favorite settings. Um, one of the issues with manual control is it can be slower to use because obviously you've got two aspects to adjust every time you take a shot. There are some clever tricks around that now, but um, we'll talk about that in another webinar. So if you know, don't feel like, oh, I should be using manual just because you feel you should, uh, you know, because that's the more advanced option. Sometimes shutter priority is better and sometimes aperture priority is better or easier. So let's think now, what is correct exposure? Well, the first thing to bear in mind is that it's subject or scene dependent. So if you imagine um, you out for a walk and you come across a landscape and you take a photograph of it and you've got your exposure settings and then you, next day you go back to the same scene, but it's been snowing. The exposure settings or the um, what looks correct will not be the same. It's It changes with the scene and it changes with the subject. So yeah, there's another way of saying it's not transferable. And I think sometimes people can get quite obsessed with um, asking other people what exposure settings they use. Now, it can be quite helpful if you're sort of thinking, oh, so, you know, I wanna know more about how much, you know, what shutter speed I should use to get a certain amount of blur or something like that. But what you can't do is somebody takes a photograph of a landscape and you say, what did you use? And they say, oh, I used F11 at uh, 1 60th of a second. You go out with your camera and you set that up. That will not necessarily mean that your landscape will be correctly exposed because there are other factors such as the time of day, whether, you know, the weather conditions, the position in the, uh, uh, you know, where you are in the world. Um, you know, it's just different light. And as uh, I demonstrated with that um, shot of the tree, you can't always protect the highlights and it's not always the best thing to do. I think there is a bit of a preoccupation with pre protecting high highlights and you just need to have a sort of sensible approach to it. It's nice. And if you have a landscape, as I said, you don't want the clouds to be a uniform white. Um, you usually want a little bit of detail in there. But if you're photographing, um, a room and there's a bare bulb in there, you don't want to be able to see the element of the bulb, you want to be able to see the, the room. So ultimately that bulb is going to be overexposed, so you can't protect those highlights. But most importantly, I think uh, exposure is a creative decision. Now that you could say, okay, well, you know, sometimes it's applied more easily than others. If you're photographing uh, a portrait for someone, uh, you know, say if you're shooting a wedding or something like that, the bride and groom are going to expect to be able to see their faces in the, in the scene. You know, you, you, the, if the bride is wearing a, a white gown, she's probably not going to be expecting it to look grey. But on the other hand, you know, if you do some clever rim lighting or something like that, it might be that they can be a silhouette, but you see just the outline of their faces. So, you know, it's it's part of the creative decision. So now I'm going to look at some images and just talk through some of the exposure decisions to help you understand a little bit about exposure. This is quite a dark door and the camera was a little bit fooled by it um, and wanted to overexpose it. So I've dialed in minus 
exposure compensation. So that's a negative exposure compensation. So I've darkened the image. Now, it still actually looks quite light, but there's no burned out highlights on there. And I haven't sort of haven't created really dark shadows. So I could darken that image down, but I've got lots of detail. So I'm quite happy with that. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't show some pictures without showing Otto. So this is Otto sat on a tree. And the point here was there are some really bright highlights behind him. You know, there's big orbs coming through the sun and they, they were kind of part of the image, if you know what I mean, because they create a really attractive background, but they were fooling the camera into underexposing. So naturally I dialed up the exposure. Now I've done, I've gone for 1.3 and actually he is quite dark. And I've brightened him up because I really wanted to bring out some of the detail of his muzzle and his eyes. Sometimes they can get a bit lost because he's so dark. Um, and they really brought it out. It looks a little bit like um, he's lit by flash. He isn't. It's just a quite strong or bright exposure. This is another instance where the camera would have underexposed the image a little bit. And um, again, it's because it's, it's the camera is pointing up towards the sky. Those bright areas, some of them, most of them are overexposed, but I was actually more interested and I took a whole series of images with different exposures of this shot, but the ones that I liked were the ones where the image, sorry, where I applied some positive exposure compensation and made the leaves really light because I was interested in the way the sun was hitting them and passing through them and their light colour. And I really felt that by using the overexposure, it just made the colours look really nice. So. That was part of my creative decision. And this was shot on a mirrorless camera. So I actually saw it through the viewfinder and I was able to make the exposure decision as I was shooting, which I find really, um, you know, I didn't have to take the shot look, I could adjust and take, you know, until I was happy and then take the shot. Oh, it's Otto again. So this is just a subtle change here. Um, the middle value image, if you look on the right, si right hand side of his face, it's, it's quite, badly overexposed so that he's lo losing some detail on his face there. And I've just adjusted the um, exposure compensation by a third of a value. And I, I think possibly I could have gone and one more and gone for 0.6, but I didn't want to darken the other side of his face. I wanted to sort of have a sense of him sitting in the sun, a sort of a late afternoon when the sun is quite low. So I was quite keen to have some sort of strongish um, sun on one side of his face. And I didn't really want to lose the other side of his face into deep shadow. Now this scene um, was early morning, it was quite bright that the most of the, you know, the bridge was um, a silhouette anyway. And I've just turned down the exposures just slightly by a third of a, a stop to um, just to sort of deepen some of the silhouettes, make the sky a little bit darker as well, because I really wanted to kind of emphasize that early morning feel to make it um, seem like it was, you know, the, the, the city is just waking up rather than um, it being, you know, a, a bright day and I'm kind of pointing towards the sun. Now, one of the impacts of reducing exposure is that sometimes the, the, the colors can become more saturated. Um, and here I've reduced the exposure by a whole stop. And I think if I hadn't have done that, the blue that you can see sort of in the background of the sky probably would have been um, a bit too pale. It would have stood out too far. And also the, um, the leaves, the red leaves probably would have been not such a strong color. The other thing is that by reducing the exposure, it's I think emphasized the shadow that's falling across that red leaf, those red leaves. Now, this image, um, I could see the shaft of light coming through the trees, but with the sort of recommended exposure, it was a little bit lost because there's a lot of darkness in there and the camera was kind of brightening up. By turning down the exposure, it's really brought out the, the contrast, you know, it's, it's really kind of emphasised that shaft of light and darkened the shadows. So it was a creative decision to reduce the exposure because I was thinking about, well, what is the thing I'm really interested in here? It's the light coming through that. And therefore I need to make what's in that light visible and that, and then reduce the, the you know, make everything else darker. And this goes in the opposite direction. This was a sort of early morning, misty 
day and you know when the, the sun's coming up through the mist and everything's kind of diffuse and bright um, that was what I wanted to capture so I, I've dialed in a little positive exposure compensation just to brighten things up and again actually that was a creative decision but actually it quite closely resembles what I could see at the time. And this is an example of a shot where because the sky, the foreground is quite dark, um, apart from the river, which is reflect, reflecting the very bright sky. So um, the, the camera wanted to underexpose the shot and I, you know, I would wind up with absolutely no detail on, on the boats and very little on the church um, tower there. So I increased the exposure by 1.3 stops to um, just bring out a few more details. OK, so I think I decided it was a good idea to set some homework. Now, I don't expect you to send it to me and I don't expect, you know, I'm not going to mark it. So so don't. But I thought that it would be helpful to have a few takeaway things that you could do to really try and help consolidate some of the things that I've been talking about and help you understand what um, exposure is ready to move on to the next webinar. So the first thing is to set your camera to program mode. If you remember, that is the slightly more advanced version of auto mode and it will let you adjust the settings and it will let you apply exposure compensation. So also I want you to find your camera's metering mode settings or photometry settings and try using these, try shooting the same scene with each setting. And just try and assess how it influences the appearance of your image. For example, you know, with a landscape, um, if you set uh, multimetering, try shooting with a lot of sky, a little bit of sky and, um, you know, sort of half and half, something like that. You can also try um, doing the same thing with centre weighted and spot metering. Now, when I was talking about spot metering, it's a very small area of the frame that is occupied. It's usually the center, but there's often an option in the menu to set it to the autofocus point. So wherever the autofocus point is, is where the assessment point is. But have a look in your camera's man manual and see what your camera is set to. Um, you can then uh, try things like, so if you compose a shot, you think, okay, and then tip up to the, tip the camera up to the sky and just half press the shutter button, that will set the exposure meter um, to the values for the sky, then tip it down and press fully home to take the shot. You will have then set the exposure for the sky, but shot the, you know, the, the whole scene with the sky's exposure. So it will probably be darker. And conversely, if you tip it down and point it at a shadow, half press, get the meter reading, and then recompose and take the shot, just to see how that affects um, the look of your images. There you go. That's pretty much what I was saying. So with the spot metering, um, take one from the mid mid tone as well as the highlights and the shadows just to play around. And don't forget to put it back to multi or evaluative or matrix once you've done that, because otherwise you'll be wondering what's going on. Also, check how to adjust exposure compensation on, the, on your camera. If your camera has a dial with the numbers on it, it's probably pretty obvious that that's what that's for. Um, and by the numbers, I mean, you know, it will be things like plus one, two, three, four and five, minus one, two, three and four and five. If it's got 60 and 30 and stuff like that, that is the shutter speed dial. So don't use that. OK, now try shooting. I also want you to shoot a dark scene and a light scene, but adjust the exposure compensation each time until you produce an image that you think looks right or you're happy with. So if you go into, we were talking about the coal cellar earlier, if you go into a coal cellar, I don't know anyone who's got one anymore, but if you go into a coal cellar, um, you will find you have to reduce the exposure. So you'll have to dial in negative exposure compensation to get the image looking right. If you're in a snow scene, uh, or on the beach, you'll probably have to turn the exposure up. So increase the exposure, dial in positive exposure compensation to get an image that looks bright. Now, as I said, uh, cameras have become increasingly sophisticated. So it's often surprising what they can cope with compared to what they used to be able to cope with. And I find actually you know, on a bright sunny day on the beach when you've got really reflective um, sand and you know lots of blue sky, actually a lot of cameras cope with that really well now. Um, but sometimes they can struggle with dark scenes. So it's just, you know, it's worth experimenting and finding out what your camera can and can't do. So any questions?
Okay, so uh, Fuji X-T4 has no P mode. What do you suggest? What I suggest you do is that you uh, turn the shutter speed dial to A for automatic and you rotate the uh, lens uh, ring to A. They'll both be on automatic. So then the camera will be setting the exposure for you. So that's the equivalent. Right, does JPEG and RAW affect exposure settings? No, not really. Um, it can affect how the image looks because um, when you shoot in RAW, there is only a little amount of interpretation applied. Um, there, is, there has to be some because obviously you have to look at the image to recognize it. You can't just see a series of noughts and ones. Um, a JPEG, it does depend on things like, you know, what film simulation mode or um, picture style you use, because that will affect the color and the contrast. So it doesn't really affect the exposure, but it might actually slightly affect the look of the image. Okay, oh, this is an interesting one from uh, Maribel. It says, it's better to adjust, exp I think she, is it ex better to adjust exposure compensation or change shutter speed, ISO and aperture? Well, if you're changing shutter speed, ISO and aperture, that means you're in manual exposure mode. So, I mean, that's it's a good mode to be in. But if you're shooting in shutter priority or aperture priority or program, the only way you can actually adjust the exposure in terms of, you know, how much light is hitting the sensor is to use exposure compensation. And it, it really doesn't doesn't matter. It's a personal choice, to be honest. In manual exposure mode, some cameras, if you set the ISO to auto, so it automatically sets that, you can still set specific shutter speeds and aperture settings and use exposure compensation because it will adjust the ISO, but not all cameras allow that. Yeah, so Nikki's raised a good point. She said, heard about taking a picture of a grey card to do metering. What does this mean or do, please? You know what, and I've got one. I'm not sure where it is. I've got a grey card that I meant to show you. Basically, a photographic grey card, you used to be able to buy them for about five quid. And it was literally just a little piece of card that was grey. And um, it's about the same shade. You know the, the, the background I used in my slides? That's probably about 18% grey. That's the, So the idea is that matches what the camera expects the scene to be. So the idea is you would probably set your camera to spot metering mode and you put your grey card in the scene somewhere um, in the sort of light that most of the scene is in and you take a meter reading using your camera with the spot meter and you set those exposure settings and then um, you know it's probably it would be best to use it in manual mode because you're setting the settings and you recompose the image and take the shot so yeah that's um it used to be a really, really popular technique. It's not used quite as much now, particularly with mirrorless cameras, but also since the advent of um, digital photography, when it's so quick and easy to check the camera, sorry, to, to check the image when you've shot it, um, we don't tend to use them as much. They get used a little bit more for video. Andrea says, do you have a simple mantra that helps me remember exposure and compensation, dial it up for, dial it down for? Uh, well, if it's if you've got if it's plus if it's more there's more light so more is more light less negative less light so obviously the image will be darker if there's less light does that help i'm not sure that's what you need is some nice rhyming thing don't you or um if i half press the, shut the button to hold the exposure and then move the camera can you still alter the focus um it's getting a little more complicated now but the, you, there are most cameras have or a lot of cameras have a an automatic uh, um, exposure lock button and if you press that actually rather than the shutter button that will lock the exposure then when you press the shutter button you've still got control over um uh autofocus alternatively what you do is you try and find a highlight or a shadow or a mid-tone that is roughly the same distance from what you want to focus on Okay, but um, auto exposure lock is your friend there, Gail. Uh, Fiona says, by exposure, do you mean ISO or f-stop? No, by exposure, I mean the overall amount of light which is reaching the, the sensor and creating the image. Um, exposure is controlled by aperture or f-stop and shutter speed, and it's affected by ISO. And we will talk about all three of those things in future, future webinars.
Okay, so we've got an anonymous question here. Given that cameras are so good at compensating, is it really necessary to use the exposure dial? I've never touched it. Do you, I'm assuming you mean the exposure compensation dial. Um, well, it depends. If you're getting the result that you want every time, then no, you don't need to adjust the exposure compensation. But I think, you know, it's, it, it, exposure compensation is one of those um, tools that I use on a shot by shot basis. I might shoot a whole raft of images without it and then I'll go somewhere else and I need to put in, you know, minus a stop or minus two thirds of a stop. And then I'll go somewhere else and I need to put some positive exposure compensation in. And there's also times when I will switch and I might think, oh, well, I don't know, actually, I quite like this image looking dark and then I brighten it up. No, no, I like it better bright. And um, so I would say experiment with it. Right. So Asua said, if I half press the shutter button on the sky for metering and then point at the subject, won't it re-meter for the uh, subject? No. Um, it will. Um, I mean, assuming your camera is in the default settings, but it's um, if you half press and don't release, you, it will. It kind of it locks in the uh, exposure settings and then you tilt it down and then you press it fully home. If you half press, release your finger and then tip it down, it will redo it. So the alternative is to use the um, auto exposure lock. So you point at the sky, press the auto exposure lock. And usually what happens is that will hold it for, say, four seconds. You might see a, something indicates that it's frozen or you can just keep your thumb on it. And then you tip down and you recompose and then you use the shutter button to take the shot. Uh, Julia says shadows and highlights. She has an option to change those in the super control panel. Does that replace the exposure settings? Bit confused by shadows and highlights. Um, I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, and shadows and highlights. I think if the camera you're talking about has got a like a little graph, and you can make the highlights sort of bend up or bend down, and same on the shadows. That is ex that is um, not actually affecting the exposure, as in the shutter speed or the aperture or the, indeed the sensitivity, it's affecting the contrast of the image. And so it's kind of like, um, it's how the image is manipulated in camera. So it, if you sort of move it up, it's basically saying brighten the highlights, you know, just push them up. It's it's a kind of like in-camera processing rather than an adjustment. Uh, Elaine, if I'm shooting a bird in flight across a bright sky, would spot metering centering on the bird be my best option? Um, yes, probably, actually, if, if you can get that spot to stay on the bird and actually if it's linked to your AF point, then probably, yes, um, failing that may be centre weighted. But um, the other thing is, you know, if the sky is pretty much the same brightness, you can dial it in. Um, you could dial in the amount of exposure compensation you want. So I, if I was shooting a bird, um, I would probably use either shutter priority or manual. If I was shooting in manual, I've got full control, so I can just set whatever settings give the right, um, you know, freeze the bird and also give the right exposure to the sky. If I was using uh, shutter priority, I would use exposure compensation and I would dial some positive exposure in. And then that gives you, you know, if, if the bird has got dark plumage and bright plumage, obviously that would affect if it's a small spot, so that would affect your reading. So it might be better to use that approach. Good question from Cheryl here. She says, uh, for exposure compensation, what does the camera change? Aperture, aperture shutter, shutter speed or ISO? If you are in a shutter priority, it will change the aperture. And if you are in aperture priority, it will change the shutter speed. Um, and if you're in manual and the, it's set to auto ISO, it will change the ISO. Um, and if you're in program, I'm not 100% sure. I think it might change ISO. OK, so we've got the same question about the um, we had about the X-T4 for the Fuji X Pro 2. It says, does it have a P or aperture priority mode? You can't find it. I can see a dial with an, a red A and then a lot of shutter speed. Yes, so the dial with a lot of shutter speeds with the A, set that to A, and then you should have a dial on the um, on the lens. And that is your uh, aperture control. If you set that to A, because that A is for automatic, A on the shutter speed is automatic, you are then in program mode. If you want to be in aperture priority mode, just put the shutter speed dial on A and then set a specific setting using the, um, the ring on the lens. Uh, 
Okay, that's a good question, Pauline. She said when she presses the exposure compensation button, nothing happens. You also need to, if you need to press the button, you also need to rotate a dial. Just pressing the button kind of activates the mode. You usually need to keep it held down and then be checking your in your manual, one of the dials on your camera will then allow you to adjust exposure compensation. So if you go one way, it will rotate it negatively. You go the other way, it will make it a positive. Okay, so Nadine says, whenever I take pictures in the dark, no matter the compensation I set, the sky still looks brownish or greenish. How do I get it black as in reality? Um, with that, you probably need to um, shoot in manual because you can only adjust exposure compensation so far. Um, and also you need to set, um, you probably need to, if your sensitivity is on auto, you probably need to set a lower sensitivity because it's seeing all the darkness and setting a massively high sensitivity setting, ISO setting. Fiona says, when you say dial it up or dial it down, do you mean setting the, meter, setting the metering mode? No, I mean setting the exposure compensation. So you're increasing the exposure or decreasing the exposure. So dialing it up or down. I think that's what you're asking about. So Nikki says, so if it's a bright scene, it's likely I need to add positive exposure, yes, to the exposure compensation. That's right, yeah, but the chances are that your camera is going to see that and think this is really bright, it should be grey, I'll make it grey, so I'll make it darker. So if you dial in some positive exposure compensation, you'll make it look right. Somebody says, I have a mirrorless camera and I skipped using auto mode. I'm using the graph on in the viewfinder in manual exposure mode. Does it make sense to go back to auto or semi-auto so I can understand the theory better? Well, I wouldn't bother going back to auto apart from to just test the, the um, theories I was talking about, you know, pointing the camera towards a dark subject or, you know, black piece of paper or a white piece of paper and experiment just so you can see for yourself how your camera responds. Um, I think if, if you're not really understanding what you're doing, then um, because about taking control of your camera is about more than just getting the exposure looking right. When we talk about aperture priority, sorry, aperture control and shutter control, it's also about things like deciding how much depth of field, how much area you want sharp, and also whether you want movement to be blurred or sharp. So um, you can do that in manual exposure mode, but um, it might be better just to, to experiment with some of the other options as well, because it sounds like at the moment you're only adjusting the settings just to get the exposure right, rather than making a, a decision about why you adjust which setting. Oh, that's exciting. Helen says uh, she's about to move from the iPhone 7 to a Fujifilm X-T4, and there's a really different tone of help in this group. Oh, that's nice. And really great for this series of lessons. Great timing for me. Thank you. Oh, that's really nice. Sorry, I didn't realize that was a thank you until I uh, got all the way down. I can't, I can't, <laughs> I can't read and answer questions at the same time. Uh, excellent. So uh, Nadia has confirmed that she's can on her XT4, she can put the shutter speed dial to A and the lens ring to A and still use exposure compensation. So thanks for letting us know Nadia, that's great news. Okay, Pauline, so she's worked out how to, to how to move it, but what is each digit? Okay, so I think uh, from memory, you're talking about the exposure compensation. So you should be able to see, you remember the scale I showed in the graph where it had, um, it went from one to five and between each, and it might be different on your camera, but between each marking, main marking with a number, there were a couple of dots. They are one third stops. So when you go to a whole number, you are exchanging the exposure by a whole stop. Or, you know, so you're brightening or darkening the image, um, you're, what is it? Uh, you're doubling the amount of light or halving the amount of light. If you just increase it by a little one of those markings, then a small marking, then it's just a third. Cheryl says she uses back button focusing. Will you be covering this? How does this affect exposure adjustment? This isn't in, planned for the first series of, um, of this uh, webinar, but it could be something that we do at a later date, maybe if we start talking about focusing. Um, this series is really about getting off auto. It's about exposure um, and tackling the various elements because that's something that a lot of people struggle with. Back button focusing though, um, it only adjusts the focusing unless you have, there are different options when you set it up. You can sometimes set it so the back button works exactly like the shutter button. And then it also acts as the, you know, it triggers the meter to wake up. So, but sometimes you can split it um, so you can turn off the exposure element of the back button and sometimes you can put it on there. So it's, it's really up to you. I think you'd, you'd have to look at your, um, 
at your camera manual to work out which one you've done. Someone has asked for a camera recommendation, Fuji or Sony. What I would say is um, there are lots of great cameras and I test all sorts of them. And basically you can get great results and a variety of cameras, but the most important thing is to find the one that you are most comfortable with and that you like the look of. And when you pick it up, it makes you want to go out and take photographs. Right, someone's saying, I had no idea that my camera had a metering mode setting. I've just found it, so now I'll give it a go. That's great news, well done. And the thing is, as I say, it's just not as uh, quite as important as it used to, but it's an interesting thing. And there might be an occasion when you're photographing something, you just can't quite get it right and you can't work out what's going on. You switch the spot metering and it might think, right, thank you, finally, I've got the result I wanted. Uh, Fiona says, I'm not sure I could dial it up or down on the Canon M50. I could, it's a while since I used the M50, to be honest, but I'm sure if you press a button and a dial, it may it, actually, it might not be up or down, it might be left or right. That might be what's confusing things. Um, sometimes the, the um, scale is at the bottom of the frame, so you're dialing it left or right, whether it's negative or positive, rather than up or down. But I tend to think of it as because it's a positive number, it's going up. And if it's a negative number, it's going down. Sorry if that caused a bit of confusion. Grace says, if I'm shooting an evening scene or low light, will increasing the exposure compensation produce a better image in terms of noise than increasing ISO? Um, no, not really. Uh, because if you're increasing the exposure compensation, it has to work on something. It has to push something up. So it might, if you're, um, it does depend what mode you're shooting in, but if you are, um, you might end up increasing the exposure. Sorry, you might end up increasing the ISO. But if your camera's on a tripod and you know, you're know you setting say the aperture that you want and it's all locked in and then you could use the exposure compensation, yes, to get the result you want and it should just adjust the uh, shutter speed. But it really does depend what mode you're in. Federica says, going back to back, button focusing, would you split the metering from the focusing on back button focusing? I don't, I have used back button focusing. I'm not that much of a fan of it, to be honest. I don't use it that much. I know why some people do. So I think it really depends how you're using it. Um, but yeah, I probably would split it off because then um, you've, you've got, you know, you can set your focus and then you know, if, if your subject is dark, then you know it will focus, but then you can make sure that the exposure is based on something else. Uh, oh, an interesting one. Nikki says, how do filters help or hinder exposure? Um, you may have heard of um, neutral density or ND filters, and they are specifically designed to reduce the amount of light going into the lens and then hitting the sensor. So what they enable you to do is, to, so they effectively reduce the exposure. And what they enable you to do usually is to shoot at, um, have long exposure times or shoot at uh, slow shutter speeds while using a large aperture. So, um, it can, or, so it can be, you know, with really dense filters, it's so that you can shoot uh, with a really wide aperture and have a long exposure. Perhaps you want to blur something, but have shallow depth of field. Um, yeah, or, or sometimes it's just a question, say it might be the sea or something like that, and you want it to be nice and smooth, you might use um, a filter to reduce the amount of exposure so that you can have a long exposure. Ah, yes, so photometry is the, yeah, photometry is the same as exposure metering or the metering mode. Ph photometry is the term that uh, Fuji cameras use, so you need to look for that in the menu, whereas most other cameras, it's usually either exposure metering or metering mode. Excellent, Jill's found her exposure meter. Well done, thank you very much for letting me know. Um, Fiona says, would you still need to use a light meter if you use spot metering, especially in a studio environment? Um, some people do, but I wouldn't bother um, because assuming you're shooting with a digital camera, um, I'd just take a few test shots. I think it, it's easier and quicker. And there's, you know, it, I think, yeah, I would do it that way. Um, because you've got the whole point about being in the studio is you've got lots of control. So I would I would just take a few test shots, um, a light meter, a light meter measures incident light. So when you when you're using a um, when you're using a camera, the meter is is measuring the light that's reflected off the subject, which is why it gets influenced by black 
or white subjects because white subjects bounce more light back so the camera goes ah, and reduces the exposure whereas a black subject kind of absorbs more light so um, the camera uh, compensates in the other way whereas um, most light meters have an incident reading so it, you're measuring the amount of light hitting the subject so they can work quite well I mean they were very very popular particularly for you know portrait photography and for uh, weddings things like that when people really wanted to make sure that they'd got uh, the right value but that was in the days of film when it was really expensive to uh, make mistakes and also you know you couldn't see you could you, maybe you take a polaroid if you're really lucky but they weren't that great so i think with digital photography i just i just take a few test shots and some people get a bit um, uncomfortable with the idea of taking sh test shots if they've got clients but i think actually that's where you're showing your um, prowess as a photographer because you don't just walk in. If, if the lights are all set up and you walk in and somebody goes and you walk out, I kind of think, oh, that, that wasn't very involved. But if somebody's sort of saying, right, I'll just put this light here and just take this test shot and let's have a look. Oh, yep, yeah, hang on, just tweak this, now do that. I think, I feel like the photographer's doing something. Sue, sorry, would you suggest having a histogram on the screen to aid exposure calculations? Yes, I didn't mention, um, histogram view because I thought it was going to get a little bit you know people's minds are probably already blown and it all gets a bit involved but yes the histogram is really really useful and perhaps I will introduce at the end of the, the series there's going to be a session about bringing everything together and I think that's probably would be a good point to mention the histogram view any recommendations for small lights for indoor photography um, depends what sort of photography I mean at, at the moment I'm illuminated by a couple of um, Rotolite Neo 2s, which I think are great. They're constant lights. They're really useful. Um, they can be used as flash or they can be used as um, constant lights. So I would say those, but if you're meaning flashlights, then um, I mean, there's there's lots and you, you know, it depends how much you want to pay. And it, I say it depends what sort of photography uh, you're talking about. But I'm sure if you asked and she clicks, there'll be a lot of recommendations. Okay, so we've reached the end of the questions. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I hope you found that useful. I do feel like, um, you know, it is a bit of a, a bit, bit of a whistle stop, and it's really tricky to take it all in. I understand this, and believe me, I didn't get it first time when somebody explains it to me. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody. Bye bye. <laughs>